Andrew, first, can I come to you? Before I introduce you, would you be able to audio describe yourself to the audience, please? Yes, certainly. I'm a white, gay, middle-aged, um, uh, in my mid-50s, which is about 110 in disabled years, <laughs> um, white male, um, wearing um, uh, glasses, a black top, jean, blue jeans, and a slightly understated bright orange <laughs> velvet jacket. <laughs> And David, could you also audio describe yourself too, please? I am a w white, geeky male, about to turn 40, um, and trying to forget the fact I'm about to turn 40, uh, wearing a black uh, jumper and shirt, and I haven't got anything quite as nice and flashy as Andrew's got on. Excellent. I'm not going to tell you how old I am. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Andrew, you are the chair of the... BFI's Disability Screen Advisory Group, you are an influential cultural figure appearing regularly in the Disability Power 100 Top 10. Uh, you began your career as one of the first generation of disabled presenters on British TV and went on to become a producer director of music and arts documentaries. Currently the UK Arts Access Champion, supporting the rollout of the National Arts Access Scheme creative director of Trinity College Oxford, trustee of major cultural organisations such as the Arts Council and BAFTA. Um, that's loads. Um, I think what would be really great is for us to see you in action. So let's play some, what I hope are hilarious clips. <laughs> In such a big arena, most people in the back don't get to see that much. And that's why the stage is so big and the lights are so huge. So that even from the back, the performer might just look like a little speck. You would at least get to see something. As the audience started to arrive, the final sound checks were coming to an end. And the stars began to arrive too, to check out their arrangements and to get themselves ready. Nobody notices all this. <laughs> at least I hope they don't notice all this. And while their minders weren't looking, we had a quick chat with a few of them and asked why they wanted to play at Nebwa. Well, it's an interesting day out, and to play, obviously, to have fun. If the Wi Fi said no, I'd have been a bit of a cad, actually. Vibrations, music, all right. <laughs> David, who's a very experienced pilot, is just about bringing us into land. We've just narrowly missed some houses down there. We're going towards um, some trees, I think. I must admit, I don't want to go down. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Well, we're alive and we're well, and we're at one with Mother Earth. Well, if I can make a landing like that, I think anybody can. Goodbye. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Um, that didn't disappoint. Um, uh, Adju, uh, the BFI's DSAG, as we uh, call it for short, came from the need for disabled people to be front and centre, um, the drive to improve and accelerate the representation of disabled people and for their stories to be told within the screen industries. There's often an argument that talent just isn't out there, but from what I've just introed you and what we've just seen from, I assume, was from the 80s? Um, 90s? Just, yeah, about, about 1990, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. A long time ago. <laughs> a long time ago. Anyway. Um, well, just that's yesterday. Just, yeah, just yesterday. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, that's just proven that uh, that's just not the case. And you've been working in the industry for, for a little while. Um, Andrew, can, um, can you tell us what your highlights have been? And reflecting on that, how far have we come? Well, I think the main highlight was surviving the balloon crash. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Um, uh, it was quite something. Um, I mean, I think the, 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 the highlights for me were, were the beginning of my career and probably the end of it. Um, and at the beginning, I, I was very lucky at a couple of lucky breaks. Um, I got invited to make a, a documentary for the BBC in the mid-1980s about the monarchy. Mm -hmm. And it was from the uh, community programs unit, uh, Open Space. And uh, they invited members of the public to make programs about subjects that were of interest to them. And so I got to make a film about the monarchy in the mid-80s, not about disability. 
uh, not focused on disability. The, my disability was entirely random, really. And so I got to make this program, which was uh, you know, an incredible experience to learn how to make a film. And it was shot on film, and it was edited on a Steinbeck editing <laughs> machine. You know, It was really old school stuff. And so I got a real grounding in how to make a program. And it, at that time, in doing so, I got to see all the TV centers, so BBC Television Center, um, all of the big centers were all accessible buildings mm -hmm. for me as a wheelchair user. And of course, they had to be accessible because of the cameras. Mm. We were all moved around on huge pads at that time. And so I thought, oh, this might be a career for me. And so when I graduated from university, I, I got invited to present Boom, which you've just seen from, from Channel 4, which was one of the first, uh, probably the first program that was specifically made for disabled children. And at the time that that program was made, uh, education for disabled children was pretty much segregated right. in this country. Um, and our program was all about integration. And we felt that that was really important. And I was able to help shape that. So having that ability to, to, to shape a program like that, to treat disabled children in exactly the same way as their non-disabled uh, uh, peers were treated on Blue Peter or other sorts of programs was really important for us. And it broke new ground. And Mick Scarlett was doing exactly the same mm -hmm. thing with his program, Beat That. Um, and it was a huge success. It was getting audiences of millions um, at that time. It was shown on Sunday mornings. We were doing better than Vic Reeves' Big Night Out, in fact. <laughs> wow. Um, it seems an awfully long time ago. And that was really, for me, the high point. Mm -hmm. And it seemed, at that point, anything was possible. Towards the end of my career in, 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 on, in the screen industries, um, I was very much focused on production and direct, in directing and producing programs, uh, some of which got nominated for BAFTAs, which was great. And I really enjoyed getting my head around people's lives and making uh, biographical documentaries. There was something really, really satisfying about that. So those were, were, were my highlights. And do you think there are enough of those kinds of opportunities now for people who are entering the industry? I think those opportunities do exist now. I'm not sure they've existed in the intervening 35 years. Uh, but I think now people do have got... I, because I think we've placed a value on disabled people working in this industry. And actually, there was no value placed on disabled people beforehand. Mm. And, and I think that's the key difference. Mm. Um, and so those opportunities are emerging now, and that's really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, David, can I come to you? So um, you are the deputy chair of the group with, with Andrew, uh, actor, writer, director, and consultant. You began your career in television in your 20s, so again, not long ago either. You know. <laughs> um, and your, your first professional acting role was as a wheelchair basketball player in the children's TV series Desperados. Um, you're most well known for playing Adam Best in BBC's EastEnders, where you made history becoming the first regular disabled actor to appear. Um, you're an independent filmmaker, writer, writer, director, and producing your own projects. Currently a member of the core writing team of Coronation Street. I work for ITV, so I'm very proud. <laughs> um, and uh, a member of BAFTA and their film committee. Um, let's see some of your clips to see what you've been up to. The scan detected a lesion on the spinal column, which means that your baby has a neural tube defect called spina bifida. But what does that mean? Well, it's a condition that affects how the spine is formed. It can cause lower leg paralysis and other health issues. The symptoms, they vary, and it's impossible at this stage to determine how severe it might be. There are lots of people with this condition who live very full and very active lives. Uh, how? Could this happen? We were told it was a healthy baby. Neural tube defect occurs in early development. It's not something that you can screen for at that point of IVF. It, but they told us that it was safe. It's unlikely how you conceived has caused this. The important thing is to focus on where do we go from here? But we had a blood test at 12 weeks. She was fine. Yeah. Well, it's likely a blood test can be falsely reassuring. It, it's not always 100%. But you can fix it? Well, there are things that we can do to minimise the impact, 
I would advise both of you to not think of this as something that can be fixed. If you can't fix it, then, uh, then who do we see? What, what, what doctor do we go to? Spina bifida cannot be fixed, I'm afraid. OK, we'll go back to America. They'll be able to do something there. Joel, I need you to understand that this condition, there's, there's no cure. Not here, not in America. Um, so you were, you wrote that yes. episode. Um, your bio and what, we, what we've just seen, it, just as impressive as Andrew's. Can you tell us a little bit about your career highlights uh, so far? Yeah, well, I, I think the reason why I chose that one is I think it was only the second episode I've ever written for TV. And having been an actor and then deciding that, you know, I wanted to, there were things I wanted to say and I wanted to write. Um, and then having the ability to go, right, I'm going to write and work myself up to be able to actually write for TV was, for me, uh, a huge um, highlight. And I remember years ago, EastEnders ran a story where Bianca had a, a, um, a scan that detected spina bifida and they, and they said no to having the baby. And in that episode, they actually go forward with the pregnancy. And I really wanted to write something that where the person, the nurse giving the information was very, um, you know, I didn't say, oh, I'm terribly sorry to tell you, you know, mm -hmm. um, and use very neutral language. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I was really, really pleased that the BBC like, let me put that episode out. I mm -hmm. felt like it, I'd come full circle a little bit mm -hmm. on, on seeing something before and then going, no, I want to write the authentic version of of it. Mm. And uh, now writing for Corrie, like, what's the experience been like? Um, in terms of the stories that you're able to tell, is that something that you? Yeah, it's it's an absolute machine, yeah. as you know. Um, I think I've been there two, just two and a bit years. We've done 26 episodes, mm -hmm. um, so it's just um, by having that ability to go into people's uh, houses, you know, three times a week. We're doing uh, three hours, which is two feature films a week worth of content. Um, and the team I work with are amazing. If there's stuff, we've got something coming up at the moment, and I, I kind of put my hand up and said, would you be okay if we all phrased it in this way? Mm. And every single writer in the room went, yes, we're all gonna do that. Mm. And I explained the reasons why, and why it was, um, the, the, you know, the language we were using mattered. Mm. And every single writer from that point on was using that language. Mm. So, um, it, yeah, I feel incredibly lucky to have done that. But, I have to say, I got a little bit emotional when we had our last DSAG meeting mm. because actually as a highlight, I think um, this five years of taking an idea and thinking, you know, um, up until that point, there hadn't been a group of disabled people who just got into a room and worked out what are the issues and how can we fix it? Yeah. How can we uh, move things forward? So I just want to say thank you to the BFI for allowing us that safe space to, to all come together and and Andrew for chairing it because mm. it's been uh, yeah it's been a phenomenal phenomenal uh, experience and I think we we kind of time out now leaving this entity that is you know a, a really uh, respected body of, uh, of 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 minds that the industry can call on so I think that's um, I have to say I think when you look at it in the grand scheme of things the SAG will probably be one of the highlights. Mm, excellent. And we, unfortunately, are not able to be joined by the other deputy chair, which is Kim Tsertsky. So let me introduce Kim, and then we've got a bit of uh, some clips from her. So Kim uh, is owner of Scattered Pictures. She's a writer, actor, producer, and genuinely a bright and sunny person, as you will see from Andrew's interview um, with Kim that we'll play now. Hey Kim, how are you? I'm really good. Lovely to see you, Andrew. How are you doing? I'm good. We're all really sorry that you couldn't be with us in London today, but it's great that you're with us as we hand on the baton of the BFI screen group on. Um, uh, Kim, can I ask you to, to firstly self-describe? Yes, of course, Andrew. Yes. So I'm a white woman in my late 40s with long brown hair. Um, I'm wearing glasses and a bright pink jumper. And I am chatting to you now from my attic office, which is very white and pink or lilac, whichever way you like to describe it. <laughs> and there's lots of desks and books, um, a space I spend a lot of time in. Famously neat. 
Kim, um, <laughs> as we've seen over over the last few years. Kim, you, you've been around yeah, nearly as long as I have um, uh, in this business. What have been your screen career highlights? Oh, there's, oh, there's quite a few. I mean, each job you do, you get something different from, don't you? So I think, I suppose, going back to my early days, you know, getting the, the job of presenting from the edge, which took me all across the UK and abroad, um, looking at topics that disabled people were interested in and bringing that were quite a big mainstream audience um, on BBC. That was definitely a highlight. Um, I work on Balamori, obviously a BAFTA award winning Balamori. Um, it's wonderful children's show. I had a brilliant time working on that, playing Penny Pocket. And I suppose one of definitely one of my highlights had to be picking up my Royal Television Society Award for Best Drama Performance for Obsession. Um, it was just such a dream to get a chance to play such a, a deep emotional role, really dramatic, and throw myself into that and and then to know people enjoyed it and I won an award for it was just like that icing on the cake. I hope we see some of those clips of 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 those in in your reel shortly. But you've been a member of our BFI Screen Group since we started in in 2018. You've acted as deputy chair most recently. Which of our achievements are you most proud of? Ah, oh, there've been many. I think I'm hugely proud of the fact that the group has brought disabled people together. And then we have that community now, which I think has just been so vital and was so needed, a place where we could share our, our experiences. And that's been so empowering, I think, for us as a group of disabled people. <laughs> Thank you. That was uh, absolutely amazing, Steve. Well done, you got me back safe and sound. Oh, good. Really, that was fantastic. I would recommend it to anyone. And if you'd like to have a go at micro lighting, you can find out how you can get a fact sheet that we've provided at the end of the programme. I'm really sorry about that, but we'll put another order in tomorrow. Yes. We are the champions, Castle United. <laughs> Oh, there you are, Penny. How was the football match? Oh, it was great in United won. Yes. I'm very pleased to hear it, but we've got a wee problem. But Susie, Castle United won. Isn't that great news? Yes, but... Castle United. Penny, will you pipe down with that shouting? I've got more things on my mind than football. Oh, I'm sorry. What's up? Well, with all this crazy talk of football, you forgot to order the postcards for the visitors to buy. I didn't, did I? There you are, lasses. You'll find all the Viking maps you want and more besides. Give us a mention of your project, eh? You'll be featured in the forward. So in the conversation so far, we've spoken a lot about BAFTA and some of the re the recognition that all of your work has received so far. Um, I understand that there was quite an interesting thing that happened at the Film Awards <laughs> recently what, that you both attended that really kind of tells a bit of the story of the kinds of things that we're talking about today. I, I, I think through, through David and I and, and others' work, BAFTA uh, has really put a, a, a big focus on inclusion and, and diversity in, in, in its in its awards and at this year's film awards they they moved the event from the Royal Albert Hall to the Royal yeah. Festival Hall which is a much more certainly yeah. accessible space certainly for David and I attending and, and at the end of the ceremony uh, we were kind of whisked out to, to the glass lift on the side of the, the Royal Festival Hall and we were joined um, by Gwendolyn Christie uh, the actress big frock in a really? very <laughs> big <laughs> black crinoline and yeah. she clearly couldn't get down the stairs and yeah. she, she needed to be in the lift and we were uh, escorted into the lift by uh, one of the festival halls um, access uh, coordinators supporters 
and she was going to take us down to the floor to, that we were going to the dinner on. And um, instead of we went whizzing up, we went up to the top floor. <laughs> and the doors opened, and there was the government minister, Therese Coffey. <laughs> and our access coordinator said, anyone with any access uh, issues, please come and join us. Therese Coffey, very sensibly, took one step back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doors closed. And uh, I applauded. Uh, she also did say she absolutely flew at the people standing there waiting for the lift. And um, it was just like, if you can take the stairs, you should take the stairs. And you, you see, that is partly as well why she took a bit of a step back, I think, because she was just told categorically, like, yes. you have no reason to be using this lift right now. And it was just, it was a glorious moment of somebody fighting for access. Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and as the doors closed, I, 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 could, I started applauding yeah. and congratulated um, uh, our inclusion supporter uh, for yeah. telling a government minister to, basically to <laughs> go walk down the stairs. Walk down the stairs. Yeah. And uh, we stopped at the next floor and the doors came open. Who was it this time but Eddie Redmayne? I know. Talking yeah. to um, Jamie Dorman. Uh, come in, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she gave she gave Eddie Redmayne exactly the same, same thing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and, they, and you know, meanwhile, Gwendolyn Christie is cheering yeah. our friend from the South Bank Centre yeah. on in her work in this. Saying, this is yeah, my night. She won the award for the best performance of the evening. <laughs> and then we eventually got to our destination. But it 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 demonstrated in a highly name droppy way. Mm -hmm. um, how the, the event yeah. had been really transformed to, to make it inclusive for, for David and I to be able to fully participate. Yeah, and it's also worth noting that it's the first year that there was actually a ramp to the stage. Mm. Um, so uh, finally, um, you've got something to aim for if you're a wheelchair user working in, the, uh, in film and TV because the stage is there ready for for us. And I would argue that is one of the impacts of the BFI's Disability Screen Advisory Group, the work that we did with BAFTA. Um, to, to address the issue of accessibility. So everything now from the red carpet mm -hmm. through to the event, through to the dinner and the, the party afterwards, all of it is now made accessible. Mm -hmm, yeah. And you know, it's really important that on a, such a big high profile event that's screened on t national TV, that that's seen that actually this is an industry that can say, you, if you're disabled, regardless of what your disability uh, is, you can be part of this as well. Yeah, it's a real shift, isn't it? It's a, it really is. Um, and that's one of the examples of the great successes. Um, but what do you think are the barriers that are still there that are preventing the transformation of true equal representation currently? I mean, for me, one of the, the barrier in my career, um, uh, going back a bit, was uh, the ability to sustain it. That there were, there were no support mechanisms in place. There was no such thing as an access coordinator, uh, or, or you know, there was in, you know, the, 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 the industry was entirely ableist. The industry was deeply conservative, run by, in the main, public school boys uh, who wore blazers and were had double-barreled names, um, and it just is un unrecognisable as an industry uh, in the way that it was when, when I came into it, and um, and but that that uh, that issue of sustaining careers is really, really important mm. um, because we all need opportunities and we all change and we all want to do different things. Mm. And um, I, you know, when I came into it, I think I was very much pushed towards trying to do work focused on disability, but that isn't particularly what I wanted to do. Mm. That wasn't you know, where my interest particularly lay. Uh, and I've moved on in, into that area, but at, when I was younger, that's not what my focus was. Um, so. Yeah, we've got. There are more opportunities now yeah. here, don't you think, David? I, th I think we've. It's kind of going up the, the whole chain, and now we're hitting that kind of senior management, commissioner, um, you know, senior level of the industry that needs representation with disability. I think every board should have a disabled person on it. Yeah. Um, I think we need more sustained funding, mm -hmm. uh, which I know everyone, especially at the moment, is like there's lack of funding but come on it's it's film and tv <laughs> like we're, we're not the sector that's like suffering the most um so i think that we need that and i think that at some level um the value of disability is still not being fully 
um, appreciated. Mm. You know, the why we need to, you know, be inclusive of disability. And I think unless we can absolutely show our value, mm. um, we will always face a little bit of pushback. Mm. So, um, yeah, I, I also think we need a, a load of very high profile disabled led uh, things going into production, disabled led films, disabled led uh, TV series. And until that happens, um, I, I, I'm, yeah, I think there's going to always be a bit of a pushback. But once, you know, a drama series written by, you know, a disabled person is winning BAFTAs and once a film, you know, there's film nominees that are, are disabled, then I think that will change the change the landscape. And, and roles like yours, Sam, actually are really important as well in all of this. And Claire here at the BFI. Um, you know, creating these spaces mm -hmm. um, is really, really important. And, 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 and it puts down a marker, and David, I think you were saying this earlier on, that it's going to become increasingly difficult now for broadcasters and yeah. organi you know, major companies to start rolling back on these commitments. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. Mm. It's about the pipeline as well, though, isn't it? Yeah. Because it can't just... We can all name those excellent series or films that feature disability or disabled people, but we can literally count them on our fingers and we can all name them. But until we've got lots of programmes coming through, some of which will fail, some of which will be mo mediocre some of which will be brilliant, that's when we'll actually get that pipeline up, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and this is the thing, we have to be allowed to fail. Yes, yeah. Because there's that pressure that a disabled-led something has to be brilliant because yeah. it's hot, carrying the entire weight of, uh, you know, an underrepresented group. I'd like to make a flop. I'd like to make a couple, actually. Yeah. You know, um, you know <laughs> it'd be great. Because yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll learn on, on know what not to do next time. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think... Yeah, so I think if the industry could kind of take that pressure off a little bit, mm. um, and and also we shouldn't also critique things as being, oh, the, you know, you're representing the whole thing when you're doing this show. If mm. if I write a show, I'm just writing a show. Mm. Um, so I yeah, I think, but the more stuff goes into production, we can chat about it for hours. But if things don't go into production, we're never going to see the change on screen. Yeah. And on on there is where it matters. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And if you think about the pressure, for, you talked about the pressure there, David, about yeah. the, 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 the communities being behind you and all of that. If you think of the pressure that's going to be on the, the unnamed yet wheelchair user who's going to be on Strictly, mm. um, you know, that is carrying a huge amount of pressure. Mm. Spoiler alert, um, it's not me. Oh, <laughs> no! <laughs> I've got the jacket. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't called. But if you think about the pressure that's going to be on that individual yeah. to, to, to represent our community in effect. Mm -hmm. It's very, very significant. Mm. Um, I mean, it's great that the opportunity is, is, is going to be there. Mm. And, you know, let's hope it will open more doors. Mm. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of but, pressure that comes with it. But you also talk about factual, and I think factual is so much easier for representation. It just yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Fiction is, like, the last kind of big hurdle. Um, and I think there's that, uh, because then it goes into casting, we've got to cast authentically, we've got to, and the talent isn't out there, the talent's out there. I started this industry and I could name everybody in this industry with a disability. Mm. Now I can't, and I love that, mm. yeah. you know. And like mm. you were saying about programmes, when you get to the point where you go, oh, name a good disability programme, and people are going, up. Oh, Oh, this, and you go, oh, I haven't seen that. And, and there's this, oh, I haven't seen that. Mm. That's where we want to get to. Mm. Yeah, and some of that is about incidental representation. Yeah. Some of that is about the whole series yeah. being about it, absolutely. Um, looking back on your own careers, although there's been some great successes which we've spoken about, there's also been challenges um, hmm. that you've faced, which I'm sure lots of people in this space will not be surprised by. Um, do you think those challenges are still there for disabled people working in the industry? Um, I, I would focus on two challenges, one uh, that I think still is and one that isn't actually, uh, which is good. Um, the first one for me, when I came out of Boom, having done this successful program on Channel 4, um, and I got an edition at the BBC, which I was told afterwards that uh, uh, the Blue Peter audience are not yet ready for a disabled presenter. Mm. And this was in the very early 90s. And at that point, I knew, ah, there's a glass ceiling here. Mm -hmm. And that actually I'll only be able to go so far as a, as a presenter. And, I, and luckily, I'd trained in production as well, so I was able to move into producing and directing. And, but, but basically, I could see the writing on the wall for, for, for being on screen. And um, so 
I could deal with that. I don't think that issue, I don't think that barrier is in place anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that we, you know, we're talking about Strictly, you know, such a major UK show. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, that, that's beginning to uh, uh, disappear. The other one for me, which was a real challenge actually, was um, being a children's television presenter in the late 1980s, I could not be transparent about who I was as a, as a gay man. Mm. It was simply not possible in that very virulently homophobic time mm. to be out and proud, absolutely no way. Mm. Uh, in fact, Philip Schofield, you know, we were the same age pretty much, went through exactly the same experience and, and it clearly scarred him mm. and it's only, he only came out very recently. Um, I was able to do that 20 years ago through with my partner, Tim, um, but I have to say, looking back that's a regret mm. you know and i would say to you know younger people that are coming through you know be radical mm. be yourself mm. um because at the time that i was doing all of that i couldn't be mm. uh, and it wasn't even a choice mm. so yeah that was that was that felt important as and well to be all parts of yourself all like, the parts oh, of don't you. apologize yeah. for yourself yeah. at all yeah. in yeah. any way mm. just just be you and don't apologize mm. and just thinking about like I was watching Blue Peter as a kid then what would that have done to me mm. to see you on there yeah like that would have been amazing for me to see mm. like, it was a it, real opportunity miss. and it was just somebody's ab ableism that yeah. stopped that and actually the really bad thing about that was after that moment Mick and Kim and I all kind of disappeared. We had our moment. Yeah. And so the early night, and then from the early 90s, pretty much through to 2012, mm. there was hardly anybody with disability on, on British television um, because the broadcasters had come into it, they ticked the box and moved on because mm. that's what yeah. you know, they do. Mm. And, uh, and that's what I talk about. Sustainability mm. is so important. Mm. David, anything for you? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was horrifically bullied on EastEnders uh, and fell out of love with acting completely. Gave me lots of kind of anxiety issues and horrible stuff that I think I'm probably still slightly dealing with. Uh, but it wasn't till uh, this year, uh, I've got a film coming out on Netflix with Kevin Hart uh, on the 25th of August. Um, hadn't done any acting in three years and then got, got this uh, amazing part. And I said to myself, I'm either, this is either going to be the last thing I ever do, because mm. if I don't enjoy being on film set, if I feel like mm. bullied, harassed or anything, that's it, I'm done. Mm. And it was the most lovely, welcoming uh, place to be. Mm. It was just amazing. Um, so I feel like I've kind of put to bed a slight bit of demons. But I do think that bullying and harassment is still something, sadly, something people face today. And um, I never felt confident enough to talk talk about it and mm. say what's happening um so i just want to encourage everybody to you know it, you don't have to put up with stuff like that and you won't lose your job for speaking out mm. um and it's time that we did all look out for each other i think there's a duty of care for disabled people that's been like missing for years yeah. um and so i'd like to see a bit more of you know duty of care and work on the mental health of you know forget the ramps just yeah. forget the ramps <laughs> like how you well, don't forget them put like, them in yeah, and then move yeah. on no. so, like, it's a legal requirement to have the ramp but if yeah. i wheel up the ramp and then you, you call me a name yeah. like what's yeah. the point like so it's it's the attitudes and it's how we're included in and how we're valued mm. um and yeah i feel incredibly lucky at, both at cory and in the other jobs that i do that um but I think I'm a bit more gobby now than I was mm. ten years ago, mm. <laughs> like, and I, I will say to people, yeah, that's not, that's not on. Yeah, but that takes I, confidence, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. And I feel, you know, if you're one, two years into this industry as a disabled artist, who's kind of then, you know, you want to do a good job, you don't want to ruffle feathers, like to be able to say, you know, no, that's not, not great. Um, you know, I, I, I think we, that's an industry-wide thing mm. about actually being able to say. Mm. Uh, this bad thing has happened to me. Um, yeah. But I think with disability, it's that next, there's another level to yeah. it. There's a whole lens that needs to be placed yeah. over, isn't there? Like, I think broadcasters and um, the BFI with their wellbeing coordinators are all kind of thinking about this and yeah. processes and procedures are being put in place. But I think you're right, like that disability lens over it so that everybody understands, you know, whether you're coming from 
um, a, just a lack of knowledge or outright being discriminatory like that yeah. needs to be addressed absolutely um let's shift it into a more positive space shall we um so you've both been part of the bfi's disability screen advisory group um from its inception it needs a new um it, needs a new it, name. Needs it a does new need name. a new name so anybody got any ideas send it through <laughs> um can you tell us what you think are the big key achievements that you're most proud of mm -hmm. okay. Okay. wow ben did mention yeah, quite yeah. a few of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm particularly, I'm very proud of what David achieved um, <laughs> with uh, the visibility and uh, representation panel. Yes. So, so important. Yeah. And I think a model that can be uh, uh, attached, you know, applied to awards. Yeah. Uh, and David came up with the, the concept and, and I think it's a brilliant, brilliant thing. And it's great that the, the BFI uh, got behind it. Um, I'm also very proud of what we did during the pandemic, mm. because I think we 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 very quickly established say actually we've got to address this ableism, um, and you know we picked up the mantle with what was happening in the arts with we shall not be removed, yeah. and and we talked about ableism within this industry. So um, I think that triggered a conversation that that has continued. Yeah, that cultural sensitivity panel. I think it's just the idea that when a when something comes in. If they're unsure, they ping it to a group of people who uh, no one knows that they're on this panel, apart from the BFI, and they get feedback saying, this is good representation, this is bad. And it might split the room, you know, and it might have mixed, but then they're getting individual feedback from people mm -hmm. and are make, able to make a more informed decision. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it could be brought in across all different minorities, I really do. Um, uh, and I, yeah. I absolutely love the fact that the BFI went. Yeah, we'll give it. A, we'll give it a try. Mm. So um, yeah, so just support, support, mad crazy ideas when people have them. Um, I think is yeah, it's been great. And 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 also by my ad, it, it's been a great community to be part of. Mm. Um, and I've met so many <laughs> new good friends mm. uh, in it. And very personally, it's reconnected me to him, the kid that fell out of the sky <laughs> in the hot air balloon. <laughs> it's reconnected me to the industry that I'd, or, or had walked away from me 20 years ago. Mm. And, uh, and that's brought me a lot of joy, uh, personally, to be able to sort of reconnect with that. Because in a sense, I've sort of moved on from it and, you know, so well, that was back then. Mm. But actually, it's, it's given me a sense of perspective about all of that. And, um, and, I, and I've thoroughly enjoyed working in the, with the BFI particularly like to thank Jen Smith yes. who brought us here and the conversations began with cup of tea Jen. cup of tea yeah and that was it cup of tea in a meeting with Jen I was like could we bring a group of disabled people together she was like yes let's do that yeah and and five years later we're here we are. sitting here and opened up she opened up a door yeah and it's those moments when somebody opens a door yeah. is really really vital yeah because we'll wedge ourselves in yeah. the door to make sure we, we can get through it. Yeah. Like, as long as it's wide enough. Be sure of that. Like, we'll park ourselves right there. You ain't yeah. closing this door. But we do need the door to be open. But Jen had got yeah. the measurements right. Yeah, she, she, yeah. she really had got the measurements. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think the group also has kind of pushed for um, BFI to do is uh, access coordinators. So uh, we've got an access coordinator for the this weekend, Kate, uh, sat at the back, um, and they are also being piloted on future takes for so the BFI and Film 4's High Budget Short Film Fund. Um, how the role of an access coordinator um, is being rolled out through kind of television and and now film. How what kind of impact do you think that's going to make for disabled people? Massive impact. Uh, and I know Sarah Johnson sitting in the audience there, and Sarah and Julie Fernandez. Uh, I've been talking to them about it, and I think the impact of having somebody I've ne I've never had that on set. Somebody yeah. that's just like, okay, David, what do you need? Okay, great, and just to, somebody dedicated to have that conversation with, where it's a safe space. And then you can turn up, like, the amount of jobs I feel like I've done and I've had to educate people while I'm doing it. Mm. Like, oh, I need this. I, I could do with mm. that. And no other artist has that. They just turn up, you know, nine times out of ten late, not knowing their lines. And, you know, um, and they get to do their job. Mm. So I think um, an access coordinator is brilliant because it just means that you can just be an artist. Yeah. You can just be there and do your job and everything else is kind of taken care of mm. so I, th I think it's huge 
Excellent. Um, what do you think still remains to be done for the access, uh, the disability screen advisory group? What's what still needs to be addressed? Do you think? Uh, there's a lot that still needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, we, yes, we've we've had five years where the door opened. We started having the conversations and we've started moving things on, um, and it's great to see all of that progress. Um, I think there is more to do um, uh, working with the industry to really recognise what are the major issues still. Uh, access coordinators, great step forward, really fantastic. I mean, in, in my day, there was, you know, <laughs> nothing, <laughs> you know, absolutely nothing, you yeah. know. Um, and so that's an amazing step forward. Mm -hmm. um, but access is a continuum. Yeah. It Explode. never is fixed. Mm -hmm. It's never stops. As Jess Tom Tourette's hero says, there is no such thing as a fully accessible venue, no. for example. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, that's going to carry on and, and bringing the industry with you through all of those changes and that requiring that flexibility is really important. And although I think David's absolutely right that it's going to be very difficult for the industry to roll back mm -hmm. on any of its commitments, that doesn't mean to say we've done our job. No. You know, we've got to keep on you know, shouting when needed, coaxing, working diplomatically with to bring our own change, mm. um, but the job isn't done. Mm. We, we only achieved true equality once in our entire like, industry, and that's when everyone wasn't working. Mm. Yeah. So, it's a global pandemic. Yeah, so <laughs> when everyone stopped working, we were truly equal. Yeah. But then when everyone goes back to work, everyone should get the chance to go mm. back to work, mm. including disabled artists. Mm. So, and that's, I think, we've just got to make sure that um, we, yeah, we don't let up. Um, and it is a fluid thing um, because, you know, things happen like global pandemics and stuff. So there will never be, it will never be completely done. It's just hopefully the, the understanding, the combined understanding of our industry just grows year mm. on year and suddenly things get slightly easier. Mm -hmm. But you've always got to keep an eye on it, I think. Mm. So before we open it for questions from the audience, um, what advice would you give to the new chair and co-chair, um, deputy chair, Justin, we've got in the audience. So Justin, what, what advice would you give to Justin? Um, um, I, I, I chat to Justin all the time, <laughs> just on camera. Um, I, I would say be solutions focused because you can go down like a thing and just go, oh, this is wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong. Yeah. And it's completely right, but actually use the time to go, right, how are we going to fix it? Yeah. Prioritise and be strategic. So that's why you work on boards. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
push disabled people front and centre, the better, because otherwise we all get used to hearing from the people that we feel comfortable hearing from. Um, and we're never going to get to that senior representation piece and that pipeline of projects if disabled people aren't there in the front row with, or, with us all. Yeah, I'm, I'm only sat here today because of allies. And, you know, so I have a huge, if I ever want anything, I have a huge, it'll take back me about an hour. You're going to get kicked off the stage. Yeah, well, they do yeah. a ticking clock, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> and also, and also some, some hugely ballsy disabled people. Yes. And yeah. I'm thinking today, of course, of, of Judy Nyman, who, who, you know, the great American civil rights disabled leader, um, who I think will go down in history as really a major figure for, for disabled people globally, uh, who sadly we've lost today. Um, but, um, yeah. It's some some people, some disabled people who who really don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs>